Just two years ago, many offices abruptly switched gears and began working remotely in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. With millions of people trading in their desks for their kitchen table, the nature of how we work quickly changed. Many organizations embraced platforms like Zoom and Slack, while many employees enjoyed no longer having a commute. Even as COVID cases fell and restrictions eased, this way of working still continued. According to McKinsey's latest American Opportunity Survey, 58% of Americans still have the ability to work from home at least one day a week. That's up 35% from pre-pandemic numbers. But for workplaces that have gone against this majority, there's been some pushback. When large companies like Goldman Sachs or Tesla are telling employees to come in full-time or nearly full-time or even three days a week, you are seeing significant pushback from employees and people leaving for new positions that are much more flexible. You're seeing companies that offer more freedom and more flexibility and more remote work for their employees. They are seeing better retention. That's Dr. Gleb Zaporsky, CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. Zaporsky's company consults businesses on how to navigate the new remote work landscape. He says that on top of added flexibility, remote work also helps diversity. In fact, a future forum study found that 21% of white Americans want to return to work full time, compared to just 3% of black Americans. Zaporsky says this is largely due to discrimination and microaggressions being more common in an in-person work environment. He points to tech company Meta as an example. Meta, formerly Facebook, had in 2019 a set a five-year goal for diversity inclusion, for example, to double its number of African Americans and Hispanics working in the U.S. and women working worldwide, and it achieved that goal in. 2022, this year, about two years ahead of schedule, because it found that its workforce who were applying to remote work, because Meta was offering remote work, were much more diverse. And the interesting thing about that diversity is that people who are from underrepresented groups, which ranges from African Americans, Hispanics, veterans, disabled people, women, because this is tech, so they tend to be underrepresented, those people were applying in much higher numbers to Meta's positions, remote work positions in general. The ability to work from home also allows for a greater candidate pool. The best person for the position may not live close by, but a thousand miles away. Zaporsky says this kind of flexibility leads to a more productive work environment. Autonomy and flexibility correlate with people being more innovative and people being more productive because they're more engaged with their work. So autonomy and flexibility are very valuable. And indeed, we see that workers overall are more productive working remotely. So they have higher output and they also have higher retention, which is great. There was a study done by Stanford University which compared employees of Asian travel agency called trip.com. Half of the workers in the agency, people like programmers, people like marketers, and finance staff were assigned to work full-time in the office, and another half was assigned to work on a part-time remote basis, spending three days in the office and two days at home. They found that the group that worked part at least part of their time remotely had much better retention, so 35% better retention, and they had quite a bit higher productivity. For example, programmers wrote 8% more code which is a very hard, clear measure of productivity. While working from home hasn't shown a decrease in productivity, that doesn't mean there aren't any cons. One factor Zaporsky has noticed is that it can hinder collaboration. Chatting back and forth on Slack or email isn't the same when you're getting to know someone. The biggest weakness of remote work that we see is weakening social connections between each other meaning trust, meaning ability to trust each other. And having those in-person meetings helps with build up that trust. Another weakness of remote work is you're not as able to have more in-depth, intense, collaborative conversations. Now that sometimes in-depth, intense conversations might be about performance challenges. Those are definitely better had in person. Also some in-depth conversations about collaboration where you need the full range of 
body language, facial expression, tone to convey your meanings because those are complex conversations. So those are better had in person. Another criticism of remote work is that it can lead to the elimination of certain jobs. For example, there's little use for office managers and receptionists if the office is empty. On top of this, remote work can also set back younger professionals. Social events like networking, professional mentoring, and outside-of-work outings like happy hours are vital to forming a connection to a company. Sapursky says these are very real challenges, and each solution looks a little bit different depending on the team. So I recommend that most people in my clients come in one day a week. Now, there are some people who are reluctant. They think that they will prefer working remotely. And if they do their work fine remotely, I recommend my clients allow them to work full-time remotely. So that is the kind of recommendation I have. It's a team-led hybrid first model. What we do is we let each individual team manager make the call on what works best for their team. And that seems to work really well because the team manager generally knows what each of their teams needs, what their people need, how they do, how productive they are, rather than having a top-down mandate, like let's say Apple say, you need to come in every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or something like that. That is a very bad model, very not productive. And for team leaders that are wary of continuing hybrid or remote work, Zaporsky has some tips on how to make sure your employees are staying on track. Set accountability goals, for example, weekly accountability goals, and have weekly check-ins on how those goals are being met with each employee. And if the employee is meeting their goals working remotely, well, why do they need to come to the office? They're clearly being productive. Now, if some people are not productive working remotely, we ask them to come to the office and hopefully they'll be more productive working in the office, whether on a hybrid schedule or a full-time in-office schedule. For those who are critics of remote work, he understands where they're coming from. I think it's really important to understand that leaders who don't want remote work are coming from a perspective of anxiety and fear. They have, they're used to leading and to being successful as leaders in those in-person settings. They know how to lead in those in-person settings. They don't know how to lead in remote settings. So they have a lot of fear. They have a lot of anxiety. And we need to be empathetic to them and understand where they're coming from. The place of fear and anxiety, they want to be successful. They know that there's a certain way that they were successful in the past, and they just want to reproduce those past patterns. So that's what's really happening in terms of leaders who are showing irrational fears and concerns about remote work. And that's where I think we need to be empathetic toward them and see that they're coming from an emotional place and really help them, to show them, teach them that remote work can be done very effectively. To find out more about the future of remote work and our featured guest, Dr. Gleb Zaporsky, visit viewpointsradio.org. You can find Zaporsky's book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage on Amazon.com or request copies to be stocked at your local bookstore. For more behind the scenes, check out Viewpoints Radio on Twitter and Facebook. This segment was written and produced by associate producer Grace Galanti. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week. Less than 10% of borrowers owe $100,000 or more, but they owe about a third of the outstanding debt. Sadly, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to solving the higher education debt crisis. Then... To think that New York, since 1790, has been the largest city in the country, remains the largest, but there's a reason for that. The endless allure of New York. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints.